Fräulein Sprengel and the Origins of the Golden Dawn, a surprising discovery by Dr. Christopher McIntosh, University of Exeter. Shout out to Exeter. My, uh, it's a complicated pass, so let's not go there. Abstract. Oh, this is going to be fun. A little gift to all of uh, my friends in uh, Germany and Austria. Dieser Beitrag berichtet über eine neuerliche Überprüfung von Briefen, die angeblich in den späten 1880er Jahren an den englischen Esoteriker Dr. William Wynne Westcott gesund wurden. Absender soll ein gewisses Fräulein Sprengel gewesen sein, eine angebliche deutsche Rosenkreuzermeisterin mit dem magischen Pseudonym Sapiens Dominabitur Astris. Diese Briefe enthielten den Auftrag zur Gründung des Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. In der Erforschung der Ursprung des Golden Dawn werden diese Briefgeneral als Fälschungen betrachtet. Man geht davon aus, dass der Text von Westcott mit dem Ziel einer Autoritätszahnmatzung selbst entworfen würde und anschließend ins Deutsche übertragen würde. Der Autor des vorliegenden Artikels hat die im Freimaria Museum in London aufgebewerten Originalbriefe überprüft und darin Anhaltspunkte, die die Identität von Sapiens Dominabitur Astris in neuem und überraschendem Licht erscheinen lassen. Of all the mysteries connected with the origins of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, none is more teasing than the riddle of the so-called Fräulein Sprengel letters. For readers less familiar with the Golden Dawn's inceptions, it may be helpful to recapitulate the basic facts as we know them. The story goes that in 1887, Dr. William Wynne Westcott, 1848-1925, a London coroner and Freemason with strong esoteric leanings, came into possession of a manuscript, written in cipher, based on the Polygraphia Libri Ex Sex, Sex, yeah, 1518, of the Benedictine abbot Johannes Tritemius, 1462-1516. When deciphered, the manuscript was found to contain skeleton descriptions of rituals written in English, apparently stemming from an order with a grade structure similar to the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia, and the German 18th century Gold and Rosenkreuzer, Golden and Rosy Cross Order. The manuscript also contained elements of esoteric lore, including references from the Kabbalah, astrology, alchemy, and the tarot. Much has been written about this cipher manuscript, and there are still many unanswered questions surrounding it. Sorry, turned off the notifications there. <clears throat> also, thanks for bearing with me. It's been over a year since I've been, about a year and a half since I've been speaking German every day, so I'm quite rusty. And uh, academic Deutsch ist immer schwer, nein? So where were we? The manuscript all contained astrology. Much has been written about the cipher manuscript, and there are still many unanswered questions surrounding it. But I shall not dwell on the manuscript, except to add that between its pages was a slip of paper with a short message also in cipher, but in a different hand from the main manuscript. As Alec Howe reports, and we know he's a great scholar, this message, when translated, read, Sapiens Dom Ast is a chief among the members of the Goldene Damarung, i.e. Golden Dawn. She is a famous soror. Her name is Fräulein Sprengel. Let letters reach her at Herr J. Ega. Enge Mot Hotel Makat Stuttgart. She is seven equals four. Figures in Hebrew's characters there, or a chief adept. So that's what the note said. Um, that's from Hel El Elik Howe's Magicians of the Golden Dawn. The abbreviated motto is Sapiens Dominavitur Asterisk, meaning the wise person will rule the stars. In later references, she is referred to as A. Sprengel, or Anna Sprengel. <clears throat> and note. With regard to the name Sprengel, see Henrik Bogdan, Women and the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, 19th Century Occultist Initiation from a Gender Perspective, page 248. Here it is explained that in the German Masonic context, the term Sprengelrecht, 
refers to the area where the Grand Lodge is allowed to found lodges. So, see uh, Marcel uh, Rogemann's Geschiedenis van der Okkulte en Mystische Brödenschappen, 332. And andere Hypothese sagt dat Fräulein Sprengel and Code Word zau kunen zügen van het oh shit, my Dutch sucks, van het Deutsche Word. Sprengelrecht dit ber <laughs> it's a territorial jurisdiction. There you go. That's all that matters. Freaking Dutch. Freaky dicky Dutch. <laughs> How then goes on? How then goes on to say, SOAR SDA provided an ideal solution to Westcott's problem. By locating her in Germany, he made her inaccessible, and by investing her with an exalted rank in a suitably mysterious German occult order, he made her a credible source of authority. Again, that's from Howe's Magicians of the Golden Dawn. The Hotel Marcard existed, as is proved by a lunch bill on a headed paper dated 1st December 1887, which is preserved among the Sprengel letters in the Library and Museum of Freemasonry in London. Note the collection kept in the Library and Museum of Freemasonry, 60 Great Queen Street, London, is labeled the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and Related Bodies. The material referred to here is in sub fonds 1, series 1 slash 3, Sprengel letters, originals, translations, and related materials. The letters were, according to the first one, written by Sapiens Dominabitur Astris, by her secretary, who called himself Frater in Utroque Fidelis, faithful in both. Westcott, as he claimed, wrote to SDA, at this accommodation address, and there ensued an exchange of letters, using the translation services of a certain Albert Essinger, evidently a German, living in London. Howe's account, however, is rather different. Quote, In order to play the SOAR SDA game properly, it was necessary for Westcott to appear to write to her and for a potential witness to know about the correspondence. However, Westcott's letters, duly translated by Mr. Essinger, would never have been posted. Westcott next drafted Sor SDA's replies in English. An identifi unidentified person, graphological evidence suggests it was not Mr. Essinger, then made painfully literal translations into what he supposed was German. As and when Sor SDA's letters arrived, Westcott gave them to Mr. Essinger, who translated them back into English. So that's Hell's account from Magicians of the Golden Dawn. Howe adds that the letters from SDA are so full of linguistic errors and anglicisms that they could not have been written by a German. For over a century, these letters have been the object of debate. Were they genuine or a forgery? Did Fräulein Sprengel exist or was she invented by Westcott? While Howe and the equally well-known historian of the Golden Dawn, R.A. Gilbert, have little doubt that the correspondence was forged by Westcott, apologists for the Golden Dawn are inclined to give Westcott the benefit of the doubt. And remember that apologists actually means explainers. Apologetics is the art of explaining something, not apologizing for some uh, lay people out there. Um, note C. R. A. Gilbert, or Bob Gilbert as we call him, this book, The Golden Dawn. Hard to find his books these days, actually. I might have been content to let sleeping dogs lie had I not the occasion to revisit Ellick Howe's book, The Magicians of the Golden Dawn, which contains a photograph of the first Sprengel letter, as well as the English translation that Howe claims was probably, in fact, Westcott's original draft for the bogus German letter. The letter reproduced by Howe is, like all the others, written in German, Gothic handwriting, which was the normal script used in Germany up to and about the Second World War. This is a difficult script for a foreigner to read, let alone write. Yeah, that's true. And this handwriting is fluent and confident, suggesting that the writer, or at least the amanuensis, was either A, a native German speaker, or B, a non-German who lived, had lived in Germany for some years. It is true that the letter contains some striking grammatical mistakes, which would tend to argue for B which is someone, a non-German, who had lived in Germany for some years. I shall return to this question later. The German text begins, Liebe Brüder Sapper Odd, ich habe schon langere Zeit die Wohnung verlassen, 
wohin sie meinen Brief sandten, aber ich erhielt endlich nach längerer Zeit ihren Brief. Ich war sehr erfreut, die Mitteilungen zu erhalten, dass die geheimen Papiere, welche sie beschreiben, sind wieder einmal zu Vorschein gekommen. Dieselben wurden durch den Leben AB konstant von Jahren verloren und kamen dann in den Händen von zwei Engländer, welche um die Erlaubnis einkamen, dieselben zu benutzen. So that's from the note photographed in Ellick Howe's Golden Dawn. And the English translation made for Westcott reads, Dear brother, I have long left the address to which you sent a letter, but it was safely... It has safely reached me at last. I am very glad to hear that the private papers which you describe have been found once more. They were lost by poor Abbe Constant years ago and then came into the hands of two Englishmen who applied for leave to use them. That's... Comparing the German letter with the English translation, I was struck by the fact that the, letter con the latter contained a number of mistakes. Yeah, the English translation does, indicating that the text had been translated rather badly from German into English and not vice versa. The, there are certain words in it that gave the game away. One is, one is the word geheim, which normally means secret, although in some contexts it can mean private. In the context of an occult order, it would most, almost certainly be intended to mean secret, but here it has been translated as private. Uh, I have a, a thought on that. Honestly, if someone tr said, uh, you know, geheim papiere, like, especially with the German mentality, that could really mean private papers, especially if they were lost or they have been found by someone. It would make sense to me, even in the context of a cult order, for someone to refer to them as private papers, like, hey, my grade material is, that's private. You know, I wouldn't necessarily say to someone, especially in a written correspondence, it's secret and, you know, maybe risk arousing extra suspicion or, you know, I don't know. But it's, it's interesting. Let's see what Dr. McIntosh says about this. Then again, Abbe Constant, alias Alephis Levy, is referred to in the German as den lieben Abbe Constant, the dear Abbe Constant, whereas the translator has written poor Abbe Constant. Yeah, the... <laughs> These mistakes could have been due to an imperfect knowledge of German or a lack of familiarity with the script. At any rate, it is clear that Howe was wrong to suppose that Westcott had written the English text and had it translated into German to masquerade as a letter from SDA. Well, Ellick Howe is a first-rate scholar. He can't be expected to notice everything, right? We all know what I think of him. It is true that Westcott could have made an earlier draft or perhaps dictated the letter, but then he would have ended up with a translation different from his draft. These findings led me to wonder whether Howe had been mistaken on other points as well, so I decided to go to the Library and Museum of Freemasonry in London and consult the original letters in the Golden Dawn collection. Could Howe have been mistaken on other things? Never. Not Ellick Howe. Instinct told me that I would find something important there, but I was unprepared for what would prove to be a staggering discovery. In order to make clear what I found out, it will be necessary to explain something about German for those readers unfamiliar with the language. Whereas in English, a letter can easily be written giving no indication of the sex of the writer other than his or her first name, in German, the sex immediately becomes apparent when the correspondent uses an adjective to refer to himself or herself. That's correct. Big time. This is because the ending of an adjective has to agree with the gender of the noun it qualifies. Now, when I came to the second letter from SDA, note uh, Golden Dawn Collection Series 1 slash 3, all letters quoted are from the same series in those archives, I was astonished to see that the writer signed off as Ihr ganz ergebene, ergebene, your devoted. The point being that both the possessive noun, ihr, mm -hmm, and the adject adjective, ergebene, were masculine. They would have been ihre if it was feminine. At first, I thought this might, by a long stretch of the imagination, be a slip on the part of the amanuensis. Amanuensis. 
that's it's funny. I rarely encounter new words, but amanuensis is a new thing. Yay, I love it. But when I read on through the letters, I found that whenever an adjective or possessive noun was used to refer to the writer, he, the ending was always masculine. Then came the final letter, written in August 1890 by a different correspondent with the motto Ex Uno Disque Omnes, from One Learn All, in which the death of SDA was reported, again in incorrect German, as follows, Es ist mir sehr leid, dass ich euch anzeigen muss den Sterb Sterbefall unseres gelehrten Freundes SDA. I am sorry to inform you of the death of our learned friend SDA. Here again, the genitive ending of unseres, of our learned, is masculine, as is the noun Freundes. So now there is no shadow of a doubt. SDA, whether real or invented, was a man. Fräulein Sprengel either never existed or was someone else entirely. As soon as I may, had made this astonishing discovery, other questions began crowding into my mind. First of all, why had this escaped notice up till now? Admittedly, the papers had for many decades been held in a private collection before being deposited at Freemasons Hall, but Alec Howe, for one, had been able to gain access to them. Why had he, with his knowledge of German, not spotted what I had spotted? <sighs> Alec Howe is just a famously a biased scholar who really had zero attention to detail. Perhaps he was not a famili as familiar with the script as he was with German typography, in which he was known as an expert, right? Hmm. Or perhaps he simply did not read the letters carefully enough. That's more likely. But what of Oskar Schlag, the Zurich graphologist to whom Alec Howe showed the letters. Schlag immediately spotted the many linguistic errors in the letters, but not the obvious matter of the writer's gender, perhaps because it was simply not what he was looking for. Well, that's the thing about Alec Howe. He, he went into all of his research with a very predetermined idea of what he wanted to find. That is the biggest mistake any scholar can make, is, is deciding what they want to say and then looking for proof of it. And if he told that to the guy, he said, this is what we know for a fact. This is what I know for a fact, that this is, was a woman. So tell me what, what you have to say about this letter. And the guy's going to be like, oh, that's weird. A woman's writing with male gender. And, but hey, you've said you know for a fact she's a woman or, and didn't exist, a non-existent woman, so I won't even mention it. That could have happened. Since then, it appears with, that no one with a knowledge of German and able to read the script had looked at the letters before me. Or if they had, they had noticed, not noticed what I had. More important, however, are the questions of substance which the discovery raises. If SDA was a man, why did Westcott think or pretend that he was corresponding with a woman? How did the confusion come about? Was SDA a real person or not? If he existed, who might he have been? And what are the implications for the question of fraud or not fraud? I would like to attempt two scenarios, one assuming that the letters were a forgery, the other assuming that SDA really existed. In the first scenario, we have to account for the fact that Westcott presented SDA as a woman, while the letters clearly showed the correspondent as a man. This scenario presupposes that Westcott used two translators, Essinger and one other. Otherwise, there would have only have been one English version of each SDA letter, namely Westcott's draft, and, as I've shown, the final translation, must have differed from the draft. Ellick Howe also suspected two translators on the basis of graphological evidence. This would make sense if Westcott was using Essinger for appearance's sake to show that the letters had been indeed translated from the German. So, the scenario is this. Westcott writes a pretend letter to SDA and drafts a pretend reply, which he gives to someone he knows in England, who has some but imperfect knowledge of German, and can write Gothic script. Let us call this person Translator X. Westcott omits to tell Translator X that the correspondent is supposed to be a woman. Supposed to be woman. <laughs> Oop, typo. It says supposed to be woman. And X assumes that SDA is male and writes the letters accordingly. The German text of each letter is then given to Essinger, who simply translates them into English, not commenting on the gender. Perhaps he also does not know that Westcott's correspondent is supposed to be female, as the English translation does not indicate the gender. Westcott never finds out about the discrepancy. 
And so the misunderstanding continues right through the final letter announcing SDA's death. That's awesome. <laughs> There's also a trick that German uh, students often use, uh, foreign language students use, where they'll, instead of saying der, die, das, they just say D all the time, because you do actually get the majority of them right if you always say D instead of wondering whether it's der, die, das, den, den. If you actually always just say D, you get it right most of the time. And Germans hate that, of course, but it's funny because you can be like, but if I use that, I'm mostly right. They're like, yeah, you're mostly right, so why not just do it and make it be mostly right instead of risk being wrong more often? And they'll be like, because that is not correct. And it's really fun to mess with German people doing that. But of course, once you speak a lot of once you once you're in the culture of speaking all the time, you just you start to naturally say the right thing as a matter of course, if that's how you learn the language, or you you know learn it more uh, academically and have the stuff memorized in your mind. I'm of course a, a weird Waldorfian blend of the two. Plus, I learned my German largely in Austria, so I've got this whole dialect thing going on. The second scenario is as follows. Starting with the slip of paper found in the cipher manuscript giving information about SDA, let us suppose that the writer of this note has mistakenly conflated two different people, SDA and Fräulein Sprengel. Westcott then duly writes care of Herr Enge at the Hotel Marquardt in Stuttgart, enclosing a letter to SDA and using the motto rather than the name Fräulein Sprengel. In due course, he receives the first reply. It, he has it translated by Essinger and reports with delight to his friends McGregor Mathers, W.R. Woodman, and possibly others involved in the founding of the Golden Dawn that he has been contacted by the great German Rosicrucian adept Fräulein Sprengel. Westcott then writes again to SDA and receives a second reply. At this point, or conceivably a little later in the correspondence, Essinger spots the gender of the writer and tells Westcott. Now Westcott is in a dilemma. He cannot reveal the discovery without making a fool of himself. On the other hand, he cannot abandon the correspondence because SDA is now vital to his plans for the Golden Dawn. So he continues the correspondence, swearing Essinger to secrecy and pretending to the others that he is dealing with Sorer SDA, alias Fräulein Sprengel, and not Frater SDA. This would explain why he remained silent and refused to produce contrary evidence when Mathers later accused him of forging the correspondence. Which of these two scenarios is the most probable? What speaks in favor of the letters being fraudulent is that they so closely fit the stereotype of the fictitious lineage that esoteric groups so often construct in order to give themselves legitimacy. Another thing that makes them suspect is the way in which they conveniently arrive at the moment when the Golden Dawn was being planned, and equally conveniently nominated Westcott, Mathers, and Woodman as the three chiefs. And there is SDA's timely death in 1890, when she, he, was no longer needed. Furthermore, it is suspicious that the letters were supposedly not entrusted to the post, as indicated in the first letter from SDA. This looks like a device to account for the absence of postmarked envelopes from Germany. There is also the faulty German in which they are written, although if SDA was not Fräulein Sprengel, as I have shown, then there is nothing to say that he was a native German, only someone who appeared to be living in Germany. Against the forgery theory, one could argue that a forger would surely have gone to the trouble of procuring an impeccably correct German text. A forger would also surely have made the letters look as impressive as possible, with an imposing letterhead, copper plate writing, and possibly a wax seal. Instead of the letters are on small sheets of paper and rather untidily written in an often spidery hand. Almost like a real person was really corresponding, eh? Interesting. What sort of person might the writer of the German letters have been, whether translator X or SDA? Although he uses some idiomatic German expressions, he makes many spelling and grammatical mistakes, and he scatters his letters with anglicisms, secretary instead of secretaire, lodge instead of loge, loge, and the occasional French term couvert for sealed letter, and in one place secretaire for secretary. Such a person could have been an Englishman who had spent time in Germany, or a person of Anglo-German background whose German was imperfect. 
why not a French person who was living in Germany? There was so much Rosicrucian stuff going on in Germany and France. They were interconnected in such a massive way. Why not a French person who spoke some German? Alternatively, he might have been someone from one of the territories of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, such as Hungary or Bohemia, where German was common currency in addition to the national language. One possible candidate who has been suggested to me by Dr. R. A. Gilbert is Julius Kohn, apparently a Jewish immigrant and author on alchemical subjects who was in contact with some of the Golden Dawn figures. In the collection of letters of the Golden Dawn member W. A. I. Aiton, Edited by Ella Cow, there are a number of references to Cohn. For example, on 3rd April 1894, Aiton wrote to his fellow Golden Dawn member F.L. Gardner, I have told you I have a Jewish learned friend who is very advanced, though he never would belong to any order or society. Note, uh, that's from Ella Cow's uh, edit edited book, The Alchemist of the Golden Dawn. And... Uh, Ella Cow comments as follows, quote, It has not been possible to discover anything about Cohn's life, but in the introduction to his translation of the prophecies of Paracelsus, magic figures and prognostications, he mentions that, 195, he mentions that his studies in the occult have now extended over 50, 40 years, which suggests that he was born circa 1850. In his Hermetic Catalog, number 23, summer 1981, Mr. Gilbert, i.e. R.A. Gilbert, described Kohn as an Austrian émigré. Immigrant. Of course, Kohn is only one possible candidate, and pending further evidence, the identity of Translator X must remain a mystery. As I see it, there are now four main explanations for the correspondence. A. SDA was a fiction created by Westcott, and the gender discrepancy came about in the manner I have outlined in the first scenario. B. He was a fiction created by someone other than Westcott. C. He was an imposter, posing as a Rosicrucian adept. And D. He was what he claimed to be a member of a German esoteric lodge willing to confer authority on Westcott, Mathers, and Woodman to found an English offshoot. It's, it's always important to remember that there was like so many magical orders in Germany and France and it was just much more prevalent there. Um, it never seemed to me that strange that they would get in touch with someone. Um, like where do you think Rudolf Steiner was trained? He was a Freemason and also part of different magical orders in Germany and Austria and, and, and France and stuff. So it's always seemed very plausible that someone was writing little letters back and forth and uh, Alec Howe's arguments and statements always seemed bad because a lot of Alec Howe's scholarship is bad. But um, this is a really amazing article to finally get from someone who actually went and looked at the real letters with actual knowledge of German. Thanks, Dr. McIntosh, you rock. While I would agree, argue that the weight of the evidence points to A, i.e. the old forgery theory with a new twist, one cannot be sure. However, one thing we can say with certainty is that SDA was not Fräulein Sprengel. So, we can bid farewell to Sor SDA. Vale Sor Ave Frater. <laughs> that means, see a, see a sister, welcome brother, hail brother. Acknowledgements on this piece. Uh, the author is most grateful to Dr. Don, Donate McIntosh, or is it Donata McIntosh, for a key insight and for advice on a number of linguistic points, as well as to Dr. R.A. Gilbert for sharing his expertise on the Golden Dawn and the figures connected with it. Thanks are also due to the staff of the Library and Museum of Freemasonry in London for their kind assistance, and to Dr. Peter Forshaw, oh, I love Peter, Peter Rocks, editor in chief of Aries for fine-tuning. Uh, if you want to see more on this uh, debate, um, Pam, uh, Sam Robinson at pansofers.com has uh, an extension of this whole investigation. Um, I'm not sure how reliable it is, but it's something that's definitely worth discussing. Um, one of the things, uh, one of, an example of, of, of Robinson's view is, uh, uh, finally we reach some rather strange twists with discovery that the German groups themselves claim to have possessed knowledge about Sprengel and the chartering of the early GD lodges, all done against the will of the chiefs in Germany. In A.E. Waits' notebooks, for example, with, 
which recorded the meetings between he and Dr. Falcon in 1911, he covers this issue. He explains that after Falcon's return from Germany in 1910, and then after he sent his pupil, Neville Meekin, back to Germany to become initiated in Steiner's Memphis service. What was I saying? See, exactly. The following information was returned. Germans say SDA, Sapiens Dominabitur Asterisk, Fräulein Sprengel, story, i.e. Woodford and S.A., which is Sapper Odd, Frater Sapper Odd Westcott, true, but will send no more warrants as they have been lost. They recognize Isis Urania, which is in FRS, Dr. Robert Falcon's hands. Apparently this means that in Germany, those who were among Steiner's circle considered the Sprengel story to have been true, or were they just bluffing? I love that my guess, since my whole life has proved to be hold the most water. But Sam Robinson knows his shit, of course. Uh, he was uh, Zalewski's protege until Martin did his magical... Uh, tricks on him and ousted him. I know the details of that because my mom was at their place in Montreal at the time being initiated into Portal and I got the first hand story play by play and how abused she was at that time by Martin. Anyway, fun stuff. Cheers for now guys.